All right, Sean. Sean Carroll is, well, you've been, it's, it's been a track through the University of Chicago, UC Santa Barbara, worked at MIT, now a senior research associate in physics at Caltech. And he, you can read what he works on, but what's interesting particularly is he's a contributor to the blog Cosmic Variance, which I suggest you have a look at. It's really a great blog. Sean Carroll. Thanks. I once uh, taught, co-taught a course on the history of atheism, and both me and my co-teacher were atheists, so we thought, to be fair, as a guest speaker, we would bring in a non-atheist. And we invited uh, Father William Buckley, who was a Jesuit priest at Boston College and the author of the best scholarly work on the history of atheism. And he came and he gave some great talks. He was an alumnus at the University of Chicago. And at some point, as we're talking, he puts his arm around me and says, Sean, you don't think that I believe in G-O-D God, do you? <laughs> so uh, I'm suspecting it is possible for Catholics to be atheists as well. And the word God is fraught with all sorts of things that I don't understand. Uh, my, I won't need to take very long because my topic is eternity. And it, everything pales. It will go very, by very quickly. Uh, what I'm here to say about eternity is that we might be living in it. That despite what some of my cosmology friends may have been telling you, it is very, very possible, maybe even plausible, I would argue reasonable, to imagine that the universe has always existed, did not come into existence at what we call the Big Bang. And the relevance of this, one of the relevances of this to this particular conversation we've been having, is that the question of the origin of the universe uh, is what we call a gap. It's one of those parts, one of those questions we're faced with in our tr attempts to understand the universe in purely rationalistic terms, where some people are tempted to blink and say, you know, that's something that your science is never going to understand, the absolute origin of the universe. We need to invoke the help of this guy, the Ancient of Days. And I'm surprised that no one here giving a talk has sort of referred to this wonderful backdrop we have in order to discuss the beginning of the universe, the thing would go, we need to appeal to something outside the ordinary understanding of science. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say that that's actually not true. And I will get there by discussing a prior gap that existed and went away. And that gap is the concept of motion, which you don't even think of as a gap these days. We don't think of it as something that really requires an explanation. But if, like me, you went to a good Catholic university and took many courses on religion, you were subjected over and over again to the proofs for the existence of God, and some of them made more sense than others. And many of them sounded exactly the same and made no sense, and they all went something like, the universe has things moving in it, and when something is moving, it's because something else caused it to move, and there is a chain of things causing other things to move, and that chain has to terminate in what is called the unmoved mover, or the prime mover. Likewise, there's an argument from the first cause. Events have causes. The thing that is causing it needs to be caused, etc. You go all the way back. None of these arguments ever made any sense to me, not just from m most people sort of say, well, that's, that business about the chain being unable to end leaves me a little bit uneasy. But it was the first step that left me uneasy. Why can't things just move? Why do we need to explain that something is moving it? And eventually, uh, I came to understand that there was a reason, because Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, or before him, Aristotle, who were pushing these arguments, had a different view of the physics of the world than we do now. They had Aristotelian physics. And Aristotle would tell you things like, uh, if you have an object and you want it to be in motion, you have to keep pushing it, because if you stop, it stops. And Aristotle was right. It stopped when I stopped pushing it. He was not wrong. I mean, physicists like to make fun of Aristotle these days, but he was right in the context that he was talking about. So if you believe that as a fundamental fact about stuff in the world, motion only exists when there's something pushing it, then you can imagine that these kinds of arguments make sense. That the fact that we see things moving in the universe, despite the fact that motion requires a mover, makes you believe that there must be some prime mover out there behind the whole thing. And then comes along Galileo and Newton. And they say, actually, if you think about it carefully, the natural status for objects is uniform motion. It's just because of friction and dissipation and other annoying features of the world that we see things stop. That at a fundamental level, things want to keep moving. And unless you act upon them, they will remain in uniform motion. This notion, conservation of momentum, completely undermined 
the sort of metaphysical the reasoning behind the arguments for first cause and a prime mover and things like that. And you can actually see the impact on the theological literature. Once they invented Newtonian mechanics, arguments for the existence of God changed their focus from prime movers, first cause, arguments from contingency to the argument from design. They started inventing machines and they said, oh yeah, the world looks like a machine and maybe there was a machinist and so forth. And then Darwin, to a good extent, undercut that argument, and then we, uh, we are still living in the aftermath of that. So, however, sometimes gaps are created that you didn't think were there. In Newtonian mechanics, one thing you don't need to understand is the origin of the world. In Newton's world, the universe was eternal. Space and time are absolute. They always existed. You didn't have to talk about what was the first moment. Newton himself believed in God, and he believed that the whole shebang was created by a God, but not because there was a moment that had to, had to be explained. Then comes along Einstein, and Einstein tells us that space and time are not absolute. They're dynamical. They can change. They can move. And in fact, space can expand. And in fact, Edwin Hubble comes along and looks at the universe and says, aha, it is expanding. Galaxies are moving apart from each other. And people began to take seriously this fact about the universe. And it was, in fact, another priest, not a Jesuit, but uh, Abbe Georges Lemaitre, who first took absolutely seriously the implication of Einstein's theory and the expansion of the universe to what happened in the past. He extrapolated backwards, solving the equations, and said, look, the universe had a finite lifetime. It originated in what he called the primeval atom and what we now call the Big Bang. As far as I know, he never tried to make any theological money out of this. He just solved the equations like a good scientist did. Uh, but there you had it. There you have a universe that is now has a, an origin, a moment in time when it begins. And now a lot of people for a long time thought that uh, the, well, so what I, wanna, what I wanna say is that that's a puzzle. If you believe that the universe comes into existence at some time, then you have to say, why did it come into existence? Why did it have the particular properties it had when it came into existence? And very few of us pretend to know. We say that uh, you know, God or the Dalai Lama or Stephen Hawking made it that way. And we're not sure yet, but at some point we'll try to understand. That's one of the gaps. It's one of the things we don't yet understand. And recently, cosmologists have become increasingly comfortable with saying that actually it's not true that the universe came into existence at the Big Bang. We will tell you a uh, very elaborate story about what the Big Bang means. It's a boundary to the existence of the universe. And if you ask me questions like what happened before the Big Bang, I will poo-poo you and say there is no such thing as before the Big Bang. And I'm going to tell you now that that's uh, not exactly as respectable as we try to convince you that it is. And that's for two reasons. One is that we actually understand the future of the universe better now than we used to. Not only was the universe expanding in traditional Einstein cosmology, but we didn't know what would happen in the future. Maybe it would expand forever, but maybe it would recollapse. Maybe the evolution of space-time would stop expanding. The gravitational force of galaxies would pull them together. And then you would have a big crunch in the future, which was kind of nice. It was a pleasing symmetry. Einstein himself liked this idea because the entire history of the universe would be in finite duration. It came into existence, it went out a few billion years, and that was all she wrote. These days, we are increasingly skeptical that that is the future of our actual universe. And the reason why is because we've looked at the universe once again, and we've seen that not only is it expanding, but it's accelerating. The galaxies that we see in the universe show no signs of slowing down and coming back together. They are moving apart faster and faster. And we have models to explain this involving dark energy. But we, even though the models are not firm, they tend to make you think that what will happen in the universe is that it will expand forever and ever. The future of the universe is an increasing story of dilution and cooling off and getting emptier and lonelier and slowing down, leaving you with empty space. If that is true, and it's by no means established, but at least seems very plausible, if not likely, then you have this weird asymmetry between the end of the universe, which goes on forever, and then the beginning. Why was there a beginning at some point if the future goes on forever? So that's one question. The other is, this story that we told you that convinced you there was a Big Bang is not internally consistent. 
we have theorems within Einstein's general theory of relativity, within our understanding of classical gravity, that given the conditions of the universe now, there must have been a singular point a point where the universe was infinitely dense and infin had infinite space-time curvature. And we can even tell you when it was. It was about 14 billion years ago. And we even have data that tell you what it looked like one second after the Big Bang. However, these theoretical demonstrations using classical general relativity can't be right because this infinite point of singularity means that general relativity is not correct at that point in the universe's history. And nobody thinks that it is correct. What actually has to happen is that some better theory has to come into play before you hit this singular state. Normally we think it's some quantum theory of gravity that we haven't yet developed. But the point is, all of our firm declarations that there wasn't anything before the Big Bang are based on a theory that doesn't apply at the Big Bang. So let's think hard about what could be right. We don't know yet the answer, but if you imagine trying to understand how quantum mechanics would change our notion of the early universe, it is more plausible than not that there was something before the Big Bang, that there was some pre-existing space and time from which the Big Bang evolved. The Big Bang was an event in the history of the universe, not the beginning of it. And I can tell you specific scenarios. I have my own, it's, you know, you're not really a, fully trained cosmologist unless you have your theory of either where the universe came from or where it's going. And I think that the best way to look at it is probably there was a pre-existing parent universe and we are an offspring. We are a baby universe from that pre-existing parent. The pre-existing universe was perfectly empty, but because of the influence of vacuum energy, which we now think we've uh, detected the influence of, there's tiny quantum fluctuations, which means that even empty space is not perfectly stable. Even a universe with nothing in it can have a little, very unlikely, but inevitable in an eternal universe, event that gives rise to a whole new universe. And I would even argue, if I had much more time, that this is an explanatory theory because it explains features of our post-Big Bang universe that are extremely hard to account for otherwise, such as the arrow of time and other things that we observe about it. But I won't go there right now. Instead, I want to make a huge leap far beyond what I've just given you evidence to believe in, and draw a moral from this story of the fact that the universe may very well be eternal. And the moral is, don't bet against the enlightenment. Don't bet against the power of totalitarian, reductionistic scientific reasoning to explain things that might seem inexplicable at first blush. If you thought the universe came into existence, you might be tempted to conclude we need to explain the features of the universe by appealing to some agency outside the universe itself. Then you wait around and your cosmologist friends come along and say, actually, the universe didn't come into existence. It's been around forever. You don't need to explain that particular feature of it. I would like to claim that things like that, episodes where a problem seems really hard and yet a few years later, you realize, oh, I have an idea that actually makes sense of that, are happening all the time and are characteristic of several things we've already been talking about today. The problem of the origin of the universe is a really trivial and simple and easy problem compared to the problem of the evolution of the entire biosphere or the origin of morality or the nature of romantic love. But I would argue that all of these, since I'm one of the two people who Stuart kept uh, referring to, that all of these are things that could, in principle, although obviously not in practice, be understood as the working out of the laws of physics. Nobody, there's, there's two possible arguments we could have here. One is, should you think of all these phenomena usefully as the working out of the standard model of particle physics or superstring theory or something like that. And there's nobody in the world who thinks the answer is yes. So that's not an interesting argument to have. The only interesting argument is, could you think about everything that happens in the universe as simply materialistic particles obeying their equations of motion? And I strongly think that the answer is yes. And I've seen no evidence whatsoever in anything that Stuart said or anyone else to convince me otherwise. I think what happens is we look at problems that seem really, really difficult and we lose our nerve. We tend to blur the distinction between the infinite and the merely really big. The distinction between the impossible and the kind of difficult. Or the distinction between uh, 
things that we see all around us happening all the time and things that are actually necessary and could not be otherwise. When we see that many people around think that child slavery is bad, we begin to think that there's some intrinsic thing that needs a transcendental explanation for the fact that we have a universal morality that doesn't believe that we should enslave children. Then again, we have to admit that there were actually people out there who were enslaving children. So it's not as, as universal as it could be. It also seems, I would admit, if you don't look at it in the right way, it can seem impoverishing to claim that things like beauty and morality and ethics could be understood as the workings out of the laws of nature according to the equations of motion that they obey. But I don't think that that's right either. I think that it is no more, it, it no more reduces the understanding of human morality to say that it's consistent with saying that nothing ever happens in the universe that can't be expressed as a working out of the laws of physics, then, I doubt this sentence is going to make grammatical sense, but then it reduces the beauty of a rainbow to understand the electromagnetic spectrum. They're just different. It might be very, very useful in certain circumstances to talk about morality and right and wrong, and the fact that that is useful and the fact that that's the way we should be thinking about it is in no way incompatible with the fact that we could all, in a complete description, think of ourselves as particles obeying the standard model of particle physics. So because we're faced with these problems that are hard, but nevertheless, we see specific examples of hard problems that get solutions, I would say that we should look at the problems of where does love come from, where does morality come from, how does the biosphere evolve and say, these are hard problems, let's get to work. Thank you.